Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our stream. Uh, my name is Varun Karthal. This is Shruti Shrinivas, and we're very excited to be able to be here to talk to you about uh, some of the main topics in AP World History and Modern Units 1 and 2. Anything that you want to know, voice your concerns here. It's a live study group from the East Coast, so any concerns you guys have, we'll answer all of them. So make sure to stay tuned until the end of our stream. Um, and again, we're very excited to be able to be here to talk to you guys about this subject. I myself, I'm a high school sophomore from Georgia. I received a five on the 2019 AP World History exam. And I went on to receive a 790 out of 800 on the 2019 SAT subject test in world history. So this is content that I'm hands on with. I love this content and it's just something I'm, I'm very excited to be able to talk to you guys about. So I'm a great resource. I'm sure Shruti is. She'll talk to you about her own achievements in AP World History. Um, so this is something we're all both interested in and uh, a very, very exciting topic for us. Yeah, so um, I'm a college freshman from Nevada, so I understand this is an East Coast uh, study group, but uh, I can still participate I or host it, I guess. But um, yeah, I'm a college freshman. I received a five on the world history exam, not on the 2019 one, That's a that should be there, on the 2016 one, or the 2017 one, because I took it like three years ago, two years ago. And um, I received a 800 on the 2017, again, SAT subject test in world history. Writing skills and to kind of really bring them out here. It's an introductory analysis of the Mongols. So the source in this document is two excerpts written by the disciple, by the disciple of Taoist master Chang Chun, when summoned to visit Chinggis Khan as translated by Arthur Whaley in his travels of an alchemist. And under here are two different pictures of uh, the Taoist master and Genghis Khan, or Chinggis Khan. Um, I'll read this excerpt out loud for you and give you guys a few minutes to really analyze it yourself. And we'll see what uh, we really came off with, what really stood out to us. So. I'll start now. It was now the 29th of the third month, May 11th, and the master made a poem. After four more days of traveling, we reached the Khan's camp. He sent his high officer, Halabode Karabadur, to meet us. This was on the fifth day of the fourth month. When arrangements had been made for the master's lodging, he had once presented himself to the emperor, who expressed his gratitude, saying, Other rulers summoned you, but you would not go to them. And now you have come 10,000 li to see me. I take this as a high compliment. So go ahead and analyze this uh, document yourself and kind of in a few minutes, we'll ask you guys for some uh, things that you really saw from this document, from the source itself and from these pictures. All right, so why don't we um, sh just talk about some things that we saw in this document. What really stood out to you guys? It's about the source, the pictures, or the document. Anything is, um, anything is good information for us. Again, if there's any uh, information you guys have to add, some highlighted information, something you guys liked uh, from this document, make sure to reach out. Uh, put it in the chat section because we're kind of trying to analyze this document. Or if you want any clarification about the document, ask that too, of course. Yeah. And don't be afraid. I mean, we're here to help you guys. The Chinese Han appearance of Kublai Khan, for sure. Yeah. Um, then, yeah. I mean, d down here we have the Taoist master Chang Chun, um, but also under Kublai Khan, as Mr. Duarte was mentioning, um, again, this document was not written when Kublai Khan was alive, but after later on, uh, we see Kublai Khan take China. And that's a very, very... Um, transformational thing that happens during the Mongol Empire's reign. Um, and But they were still making advances into China because from the start of the Mongol Empire and Genghis Khan, they wanted to go into China. And the Song Dynasty was their main objective. So remember that for the Mongol Empire. Anything else you guys have to add? This document had a lot of useful information you guys could have highlighted. All right, so let's analyze this document. So first of all, it's written by the disciple of a Taoist master, Chang Chun. Uh, if you know anything about Dao, Taoism, Taoism is a religion um, wherein they basically, it was kind of like Confucianism, what they did revere nature and they revered uh, some of the law codes of nature, the natural, natural codes of the world. So Taoism started in China and uh, this Chang Chun master from China says a lot about the overall Mongols uh, cultural reach and things like that. It also says a lot about Genghis Khan's cultural inclusivity because he was able to meet with this 
master. He wanted to meet with this master. Uh, we also see in this document um, that, I mean, Genghis, he made a poem that even shows that Genghis Khan was, uh, was very, very, um, you know, he liked, you know, the art. He subsidized the arts, which we see in a lot of Mongol emperors. They subsidized the arts and he accepted Taoism as um, a great faith for himself. He summoned this ruler uh, for him, this, uh, this little religious leader. So um, it says a lot about the Mongols' inclusivity, if nothing else. Um, and what Donald uh, Dorto said in the chat is also important, um, that the highly tolerant nature of the Mongols to other religions as well. So again, they were pretty, they, they weren't very um, strict on like having one religion or another because they were tolerant towards most. All right, so okay. present this, yeah. Yeah, so uh, here's a practice short answer question that you might be asked on the exam based on um, the document that you just read. So um, answer parts A, B, and C. Identify and explain one perspective that led to um, Genghis Khan meeting the Taoist ma master Chang Chun. B, briefly explain one example of how the Mongol Empire diffused foreign cultures. And C, identify and explain one aspect of the sourcing of this document that influences the content. How so why students? don't you guys answer um, prompt A first? We'll go through some of that. So in the chat, uh, please place your answers to prompt A. Identify and explain one perspective that led to Genghis Khan meeting with the Taoist master, Chung Chun. Like some of the perspectives of the Mongol Empire and the whole of their leaders as a whole. So definitely go ahead and try to explain this prompt. And don't be afraid, guys. I mean, um, we're doing this all for you so we can point out some errors. We can point out some good points in each of your things. And it makes the experience much, much more beneficial to you if you participate in this. Again, just place it in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. That's fine. I believe you guys uh, are on a minute here to put in your answers. Or if it takes longer, just let us know. Yeah. All right, so is everybody good with that? Anybody want to add something? for prompt day or do you want to go ahead and uh, analyze that? All right, so Mr. Dorko has a great answer here. Um, one factor that led to Genghis Khan meeting Taoist master Chang Chun was the Mongolian desire to not promote their own religion, but to offer tolerance and acceptance to other religions. And that's exactly spot on. I mean, the Mongol empires, when you think about the Mongol empire and their rulers, it was, they were diffusers. They weren't really, um, they didn't really spread the religion over anything else because again, animism was a very, very centralized religion. Uh, they were localized. So the Mongol empire, they wanted to spread other religions. So that's really, they were diffusers. They took from other religions. They didn't really spread their religion as much. And beyond mm -hmm. that, when you look at the answer itself, you see like how concise it is. Again, it's a short answer question. You don't need to say more than you technically need to, especially since it says identify and explain one perspective. So did he identify? Yes, he said that the, Ching, um, the Genghis Khan being Taoist master Ching Chun was a Mongolian desire to not promote their own religion. And then explaining was to offer tolerance and acceptance to other religions. So on the actual exam, you can expand on that if you want to, but um, essentially like the bare bones um, answer of what we're really looking for here is present. That's the ACE method. It's the uh, answer, cite, and explain. That's really how you answer SAQs. It doesn't have to be very, very intensive. It doesn't have to be very long, but it should be concise. It should be explanatory. All right, so moving on to prompt B. Briefly explain one example of how the Mongol Empire diffused foreign cultures. So uh, make sure to answer this in the chat. Use the ACE formula.
Again, great point for Mr. Diorto. Um, the animism was a very localized thing. It wouldn't spread well throughout the world, just like Hinduism. Hinduism wasn't a very universalizing religion. Uh, animism wasn't as well. So Taoism would be accepted throughout the world, and it could be used to uh, expand his own influence. This is something to add for prompt day. So yeah, briefly explain how one example of how the Mongol Empire diffused foreign cultures. All right, so does everybody have ample time to answer this prompt or do we need more time here? All right, so let's tackle this prompt. So briefly explain one example of how the Mongol Empire diffused uh, foreign cultures. So if you know anything about the Mongol Empire uh, or what they did during this period, you can immediately point to the Silk Roads because the Mongol Empire was a huge subsidizer of the Silk Roads, which means that they really increased safety and uh, trade along the Silk Roads. And also, as Mr. Diorto stated, um, uh, the Mongols, when they conquered other cultures, they spread their captives throughout the empire. Those who could become soldiers would be moved to, into other parts of the Khan's army. This is similarly to the Khan's approach towards religion. So they really uh, conquered other cultures and they conquered the people there and put them into their army. And because of this, they're replacing other religions within their empire, which really spread foreign cultures because, again, the Mongol Empire is huge. I mean, it's across uh, Asia, across Afro-Eurasia, because it's just so big. So when they have people like this within their empire, they assimilate them and they don't discriminate against them. It really spreads this religion more. So uh, we're talking about the Silk Roads, we're talking about a cultural diffusion. So anything else to add, Shruti? Um, No, I think you hit all the bases. Again, looking at this question, it's looking at the formula. It's basically what we want. So again, this is a model. It isn't exactly how you're supposed to answer the question because we're not trying to get you to answer the question in one way or another but basically just answering what the question asks you as simple as it is all right so prompt c identify and explain one aspect of the sourcing of this document that influences the content so go ahead and um, answer that in your own words Again, the sourcing, I'll go back for you guys. It's actually two excerpts written by the disciple of Taoist master Chang Chun when summoned to visit Genghis Khan. So talk about how the disciple of Chang Chun, uh, his own relation to the empire may have influenced what he wrote. Any ideas, feel free to leave them in the chat. This is what we're here for. So don't be afraid to answer this prompt to its entirety because uh, closer to the AP exam, you're gonna to wanna to do this kind of stuff. I mean, it's very, very helpful uh, when you go to the SAQs, the FRQs and the AP exam. So Shruti, you want to tackle this prompt? Yeah, sure. So, okay, identify and explain one aspect of the sourcing of this document that influences the content. So um, again, a huge thing that people tell you during um, these kind of document, for your DBQs especially, and for um, any prompt really that you have a um, source and a written thing for it, um, looking at the source is something that a lot of students forget to do. And I think it's very important just because it, it, again, it influences a lot of what's being said and which perspective it's being said from. So um, like Don Diorto gives the answer here, the document is sourced from a European academic, provides the Khan's two pictures in the background text. Both documents have a Chinese Han background, which Kublai Khan want to portray as conquered Chinese empire as part of him. The Taoist picture and the portrait of Kublai Khan are Han in form and characteristics. So again, as you see here, that um, the Chinese, um, that Kublai Khan 
as part of the Mongols kind of wanted to incorporate like the rich history of the Chinese empire into his own. He wanted to portray it as part of his own. And for that reason, he adopted a lot of the styles. So here, as when it says like which what um, the source was written by, you see two excerpts written by a disciple of Taoist master Chang Chun. And um, so they were both, um, I guess, disciples of the Taoist master. And here they're talking about how Kublai Khan treated them, which again, as you've mentioned before, was very, um, with a lot of gratitude, with a lot of tolerance, and with a lot of respect, which is, Again, as you see, as you go back to the question, which has one aspect of the sourcing of this document that influences the content, um, again, there are multiple aspects you can um, narrow down and on, narrow, narrow in on, but, um, oh yeah, that, that's also probably right. That, yeah, it's an that, obvious thing. I mean, yeah. when you translate stuff, it gets muddled in, the, muddled in the translations. And one other obvious one you can look at is, you know, he's a disciple of a Taoist master, Chang Chun, who was summoned by Gen Genghis Khan. So if you wrote something against Genghis Khan, it was not a good outlook for you. I mean, you really didn't have a very good uh, life expectancy after that because Genghis Khan wasn't the kind of guy who stood by these kinds of things. And he would, he would probably kill you or do something to you after this. So he may have been pushed to do so because he was so related to Genghis Khan and so related to Chang Chun, who obviously gained an influence for Genghis Khan. Also, you could say that he was a uh, he was a primary source document to what occurred because I mean, obviously Arthur Whaley wasn't a uh, primary source document, but originally it was a primary source document, and it may have proved a little bit more um, factual than something that wasn't. All right, so let's move on to um, essential study skills in the AP curriculum. All right, go ahead, Shruti, and uh, tackle this one. All right, again, um, again, look to the chat. I, you feel free to participate and add perspectives here, um, because even if you didn't want to answer like the last questions here, again, this is study group slash study group. Have any questions and clarification? Just let us know. Okay, so the world history exam. It seems like a really long way away, but again, it's a lot of content. So um, that's why we're starting very early to try and help you guys um, get a head start. So um, again, it's gonna be in May 14th, 2020. And there's some three things that um, are basically essential study skills that will help you it with this course and with the exam in um, particular as well. So one is being an active listener. So um, on lecture content, no matter where you're getting it from, whether it's fiveable or um, your class, especially, um, take intensive notes and really listen to your teacher-led lessons. So when your teacher is talking or talking about um, aspects of world history or going down uh, or talking about um, short answer questions or DBQs, listen in on those and then you'll be fine. Um, maintain online study documents. These were really helpful when I was in world history, especially in that, um, especially when you collaborate with other students and you say, okay, here's the unit that you wanna do, take notes on this part. Because units you want to do take notes on this part if you guys you know collaborate on a whole document and then have that in your google drive that's really helpful especially when you're studying for either your midterms in class or your actual exam when it comes in um, may also ask questions to anyone really ask questions to people who took the class before you ask questions to your teacher um, ask questions to anyone who think you'll help and you should be fine because whenever you don't understand something it's easier for you to just say well i can learn it later rather than actually asking the question and getting that information when you need it. Yeah, and I believe it's psychologically proven, because I'm a psychologist here, I know some of these things, but it is psychologically proven that if you take notes by hand, you actually gain more information. So it's very, very good practice to take these notes by hand and to really ask questions as well, which is also proven to help you comprehend information. Because for example, if I ask a question about the Mongol Empire, I'm like at least 10 times more likely to remember that information because it makes a mental mark. This is what I need to know. This is what I want to know about this content. Um, also, it puts you on the good side of teachers. You know, for example, if you ask a question in class, uh, it shows the teacher that you're really interacting with the content. And when it comes to like recommendations or even helping you outside of class, they're much, much more willing to do so if you ask questions in class. Um, the online study documents, again, a great tool to help you in AP World History because paper notes simply aren't um, durable enough, aren't uh, shareable enough, aren't collaborative to help you in the AP exam in May. Some other study skills that we're going to hit on here today. Uh, first of all, it's 
a good practice to purchase a prep book to fill in as an in-class supplement and preparatory guide for the AP exam in mid-May. Um, so I believe that both the Barron's book and the Princeton book are great, great, great tools to help you guys as in-class supplements. But I do love the AMSCO book more so as an in-class supplement because what that means is throughout the year you can use all three of these books. Um, uh, for example, I use the AMSCO book and the Barron's book throughout the year, kept annotating whatever I needed to. So when I came to the AP exam, I had uh, the best of both worlds. You know, I really had review in-class lectures and also outside sources. So it's very, very good to stay on top of your textbook, whatever one you're using, and also buy a prep book and start filling it in as you go in class so that you're very, very prepared for the AP exam uh, about May. I also uh, I recommend using the Princeton book much, much more close to time. That's what I'm doing this year. I'm using the Barron's book as an in-class supplement along with my AMSCO for AP U.S. History and then using the Princeton book much, much more closer to time because it's a more concise review of everything that's going on in the AP curriculum. I'm also attend as many video lectures as possible because it's actually proven that video lectures help you bolster your in-class learning. Because when you're at a video lecture, as we're doing today, it's much, much more interactive and helpful to you when you're learning AP World History Modern content. Um, hint, hint, five of them. I mean, we're always having video lectures here, uh, interactive video lectures to make sure to tune into us. I showed you all of the ones that we have coming up in the next week or so. So uh, make, it in a, make it a practice to attend these streams. I also recommend to do what this last thing is very, very important and can really bolster your score by like 10 times, 20 times where it is right now, um, is to really spend time, spend your valuable free time towards world history related books, manuscripts, and videos. And that's something that helped me on the SAT subject test in world history because it really helped me touch base on the content. Uh, some of my favorite books that you guys can get a head start on to help bolster your learning are, first of all, um, it's called What If. Go to your local library or anything like that, they'll probably have this book. It's simply called What If. Um, the world's foremost historians wonder what would have happened if some of the world's most um, astounding, the most turning, turn-paging events had not occurred. Uh, some of the events that occurred are Alexander the Great might have died. That's one of the ones I read about. Um, what if Hitler had not had won the World War II, had not uh, invaded Russia? So some of the world's most transformational events are kind of dissected in this book. Another uh, video series I'd really recommend to watch, and it's called Mankind, the Story of Us. If you haven't heard of it, it's on History Channel. It's a uh, recorded show. It's on many, many, many educational channels and uh, TV providers. So Mankind, the Story of Us, really goes over most of the content in the AP World History curriculum. And I can tell you, for one, um, I watched this show. I watched this show in, um, uh, I think, fifth grade. And so I still remember so much content from it. And it helped me in AP World History when I was going in. So uh, Beth said, what if uh, Mankind and Guns and Germs? Guns, Germs, and Steel by uh, Jerry Diamond. That's also a great, great, great um, book to read. And I read this book. I didn't read the whole book, but I did skim it for AP World History um, last year. So it's a great book, especially when we're going to later periods in AP World History and Modern. It gives you a very, very um, informational and a fun review to the content. So remember these prep books I have above. Barron's, Princeton, and AMSCO, and then these prep books below, um, not only prep books, but more informational and entertaining books, What If, Mankind, and Guns, Guns, Germs, and Steel. So yeah, definitely go ahead and review these books. Okay, and yeah, PBS Civilization. Saying, uh, so yeah. Too. yeah, um those PBS documentaries are always on again. Um, usually around it. It depends on where you are, but PBS Civilization is a good video source. There's a lot of documentaries too, like a lot of history-based documentaries around PBS in general that you can watch and um, learn from. They're interesting as well. So, All right, so uh, here's the bulk of our content here today. Uh, we really reviewed most of the content that you need to know for study skills and SEQs and whatnot. So let's review some Q&A topics. So any topics you guys have about our own experiences in the AP curriculum. We're very um, established AP students and also some things in AP world history like content information we have. Uh, both of us here is very, very good tools to help you guys with the content, with the experiences. So make sure to ask us any questions you need. Yep, just again, don't be shy. You can ask whatever, no judgment. Yeah, we're here for you. It's a Q&A stream. So um, this is really something that we can really help you guys with. Yeah, any questions at all, you can ask us about how we studied for the AP exam, uh, how we took notes, 
I see, I see a question in the poll section. Mr. Diorto said, could you go over the ACE method uh, for SAQs? So why don't we answer this question? All right. So uh, we talked about earlier the ACE method for SAQs. Uh, first, it's a very, very um, fundamental method to answer any SAQ, and it really is a fail-proof method. And the first thing you need to know for the ACE method is A. A means answer, and that's really self-explanatory. Look at the prompt and answer the prompt in a clear language. And then the C means cite evidence. And it can be evidence from your own experiences. It can be evidence from what's stated in the passage. And it's really anything you can use um, as evidence during this uh, SAQ. And also the E means explain. So you need to explain this evidence. Um, SAQs, they really uh, don't require that much explanation, but they do require an explanation aspect of it. So answer the prompt, uh, cite evidence from your experiences or uh, the, you know, some thing in the prompt or something in the uh, text, the excerpt, and then also explain this thing. So anything you have, any evidence that you have, you need to explain to make it more uh, viewable and answerable to any of the viewers. Anything else to add for some more? Um, no, I think you aced it. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, let's answer this question from Issa. AP World History 1200 to 1450. You any, good any good videos? Quick um, yeah, when I was doing World History, when I watched, when I was studying for the World History exam, um, keep in mind that um, the World History exam that I took was a little bit broader than the ones you guys are going to get because it covered a little bit um, more content, like over more years. But I still think it was really helpful. Um, the Crash Course World History series always, um, those always help. Um, if you, for any topic they have specifically, he, um, he usually has like a specific, he has a title for it. So if you're like struggling with a concept or like a broader thing, or you just want some like details about what actually happened, then again, just go over to Crash Course World History and then um, John Green will explain it for you. Um, other than that, if you want, um, Again, more humorous, I guess, like explanations for quick reviews. You got, um, I forgot what it's called. Oh, I forgot what it's called. I think it was, um, it's the guy who does the, if you know what I'm talking about, it's the guy that um, did the thing with Hitler and um, he had like Hitler explained in like one or two videos. Um, I forgot what it was called, but I can find that for you in like a second. Basically, there's a lot of good videos for quick reviews, and of course, there's a fileable streams as well. So if you attend these, that should help you too. All right, so here's the last study stream session we have with Skylar and I, and we kind of broke down the video uh, study tools for you here. Um, the first one we have is called Heimler's History. Um, it's actually a very, very helpful tool for me myself. It was last year, especially for the SAQ, DBQ, and LEQ. But now Steve Heimler's doing some more um, content-based review for the AP World History Modern Curriculum. And I really love his videos. They're on YouTube and they're free to watch. And they really have a lot of graphical analysis of different topics in AP World History. Um, also for videos, we have Adam Norris's YouTube channel. Adam Norris is a great teacher. I use him for US History as well. And this guy really breaks down every single piece of content, maybe not as graphically attractive as Mr. Heimler, but he's uh, nonetheless, he's a very, very good um, YouTube user and streamer. And also video content, I mean, you have all of it here, a fiveable. If you view all of our streams, I feel like uh, we're a great in-class supplement. We're uh, better than all these guys, for sure, because we have so many streamers uh, coming together in a community of people to help you guys. We're here for you. So definitely use fiveable, if not um, with these other streamers and uh, YouTube users. Also, this is not a YouTube channel or a video channel, but definitely use uh, Freemanpedia. It's a tool that I used last year, and they're one of the only updated um, online uh, content-based forums that you can use. And Freemanpedia has information for AP World History Modern, and I used it this year to kind of make some of my slideshows. It's a great, it's a gold mine, as Mr. Diorco was saying. Yeah. And again, uh, Mr. Beckman saying Silk Rose tomorrow on Five Bulls for Unit 2, uh, 1200 to 1450. That's a great stream. Definitely attend that one. Attend uh, many of our streams we have this week and next week, so definitely make sure to attend. Okay, what method did you each use for taking notes from a textbook? Well, okay, for me, um, while I was taking notes from the textbook, I tended to highlight a lot. So um, you can't necessarily do this with school textbooks. So one thing that helped me, I think, is um, having getting post-it notes and then putting them on there. So then writing down which things were like important from each section. 
So um, that kind of helped me because um, then I didn't have to like actually like write on the school textbook because I'm not allowed to, but I could also um, get the information that I needed. And then later when I was going over them, you could go just to the post-it notes and see the most important parts of each um, section. And Varun also has a um, written thing for this. So yeah, uh, this we discussed in our last stream as I was talking about before last Sunday. Um, some of the tools that I used last year to discuss content in AP World History, especially from textbooks, was I created a timetable laying out a certain number of pages every day in order to kind of avoid cramming and to get all that information in a very, very comprehensive manner. Again, as she's saying a highlighting mechanism, I mean, I use green for important events, blue for people, uh, orange for dates, and a plain old yellow for vocabulary. So when I was scrolling through my textbook, I could see all this stuff kind of bolded out uh, to me. So here's a couple of my uh, note-taking methods. I'll share it with you guys. Brace with me for a few minutes here. Because Jamal and I just did a lecture note-taking stream, so I'll pull up our slideshow from that. All right, so I'm pulling up right now. Here it is. All right, uh, so the two most useful platforms that uh, uh, Jamal and I both used for AP World History to take notes from textbooks and to take notes in class was number one, the Cornell Notes platform. And then number two, the outlining method. So I myself have used the Cornell Notes ever since I was in, I think, eighth grade. And that's a very, very tried and true strategy for dedicated people who really want to, uh, to put their own time towards this. And um, how it's organized, it's kind of like a T-chart with 25% of the content on the left and 75% of the content on the right. And on the left, at the very top, as you can see, we have name and date. And on the right, we have class period and topic. And then on the left, we have all the key topics that you need to know. Um, and then the right, it's like related information more information and so on and so forth like a bullet point platform and then also we have uh, vocabulary on the left with definitions on the right so it's a very very organized platform for people who um, have trouble sometimes seeing where their content is and it really helps you organize your information for easy viewing uh, later on also method two, the outlining method everybody uses this method it's a very commonly used strategy and uh, it's basically you just put your name, topic, and date at the very, very top, and then you have key topics, subtopics, and extra information. Um, again, it's a very, very basic formula you can use, a very, very basic outline that you can use to take notes from just about anything, lectures, textbooks, um, anything like that. Another one I used last year, I dabbled with a lot of them. I used uh, the, I think it's called a mind map method where I just had a bunch of circles and attached some other circles. And that was very, very, it helped me be more concise when I was uh, organizing these textbooks. At least in some scenarios, it's good to use mind maps, not all scenarios, but definitely consider using mind maps. Yeah, and written notes, they stick with you better. If you, if you have the time to take written notes, make sure to go ahead and do that because it's very, very helpful. All right, and uh, for... Uh, for this year in AP US history, I don't really have time to take written notes, so I take, for textbooks at least, I take online notes, and uh, one of the best things that I can do with this is that I can uh, attach pictures to each of my documents, so it really helps me when I'm trying to contextualize information, I have these pictures and I gain more information. So I hope that helped. Um, any more questions with regard to notes from a textbook, we can answer later on. All right, so Yusma Khan said, uh, what do you do if you're struggling uh, with content? Okay, so um, uh, again, there's a lot of, um, if you want to like specify on like what content specifically, again, we have a lot of a fileable, especially we're having a lot of streams for that. So um, if you need help with that, again, if you have some specific content, you just don't understand, again, we, we've been, we're, we're streaming and you can just look at the schedule and see which ones that you need help with. Um, beyond that, I think the greatest resource you could use is your teacher, because um, especially during class, if you don't understand something, asking them about it, or if during class you think there's too many people asking things or you don't want to ask something in front of other people, you should um, go and after hours and then ask the teacher and tell them, I'm struggling with content and usually or all, most of the time they're always like willing to help you so in that case honestly your greatest resource is your teacher beyond that again we have you and um your textbook if you don't understand your textbook again file has you 
Yeah, and I feel like teachers are the great resource, especially for content. Um, my teacher I know would stay up after school, especially before the AP exam, grading my LEQs, grading my SAQs, and just helping me with so much content. So I feel like teachers, they do a lot for us as students, and we can really capitalize upon this resource because they're there for us. Um, as Donald Orto was saying, ask your teacher for office hours, AP tutoring, et cetera. That is their job. I mean, I know from the AP teachers I've worked with here at Five Bull, they love teaching about AP World History and Modern. So um, I feel like if you ask your teacher, they'll be able to help you um, learn this content to gain some extra edge over your peers in your classroom. So yeah, use your teachers, use Fiveable, and use those textbooks and really annotate those textbooks and use the YouTube channels that I mentioned before. All right, so uh, I think that's the last question we have in here. Uh, any more questions, leave them in the chat or the question tab. We can answer them as we go.